Thank you, Dr. Rice, uh, for that absolutely inspirational and powerful and informative talk. Um, we have some time for questions, and so if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, wait, wait for the microphone. Okay, there's some questions over here. And identify yourself. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me? My name is Jacob Atem, and I'm from Sudan. And first of all, I just want to thank President Bush. Uh, a demonstration, of course, I'm one of the lost voice of Sudan. And I know we're talking about Middle East and what does it mean about the freedom is, sorry. I'm getting a little emotional, but I hope, Mr. President, you realize what you have done for the lost boys of Sudan. And in July 9th, <laughs> we're gonna be 193rd country. Uh, that freedom, you can understand. <laughs> that. So <laughs> my question would be, just to what you, ha you work a lot with uh, Dr. Rice, you work a lot with uh, Sudan issues, and I know it's not part of the Middle East, but now it's a very sensitive time. How does that affect the Middle East too? And also uh, the issue of a BA recently is very unfortunate. But I just want to thank you all. You give me the chance to have American freedom, and um, I, I don't know how to describe it, but at least I voted for the first time for my country, and thank you for the freedom. Well, thank you for that beautiful testimony to, to freedom. And um, indeed, the people of Sudan uh, can finally exercise uh, their beliefs, and uh, that is uh, something to be applauded, applauded and, uh, and witnessed. Um, I do think that what has happened in Abaye recently is a very unfortunate circumstance, and I hope that uh, someone is saying to the Bashir government that this is unacceptable. Um, this is still an issue of negotiation, precisely how the proceeds will be handled from that very oil-rich uh, area, and I understand that and the territorial issues. But uh, the people of Sudan are going to go ahead and they're going to form their country, and um, I hope that we are going to be there in massive support of southern Sudan as it becomes the 193rd country. Uh, it is a place that, after many, many years of civil war, um, finally has found a modicum of peace, but it has no infrastructure. Uh, it has very little in the way of educational um, institutions for its people. When people have lived in, in conflict for uh, decades, uh, there isn't much to work with except the spirit of the people. And the one thing that I do know about the Sudanese people, the southern Sudanese, is they have magnificent spirit. And so with, uh, with just a little help, not just from the United States, but hopefully from the African Union uh, and from the European Union, uh, the people of Sudan, of southern Sudan, are going to be given a, a new chance. Uh, it is uh, a place that can contribute dramatically to stability on the continent, um, as well as to the betterment of its own people. And it stands, I think, as a very important symbol of what uh, freedom can mean. Uh, right, the gentleman um, right here. Thank you, uh, Madam Secretary. Kurt Johnson. Uh, some of the worst regimes in the world are here in the United States' own hemisphere. How do you see the oppressed people of Cuba or Venezuela responding to the Arab Spring? Yes. Well, if I were Hugo Chavez, uh, who has wrecked his country, um, or uh, the Castros, uh, who've never even gotten to first base in helping their countries, um, I would be worried about uh, what's happening uh, in the Middle East because it is, even if the people of Cuba or Venezuela can't act in the same way, you can believe that there's a stirring within them uh, to be a part of this great uh, freedom movement. And I do think that um, particularly in Cuba, uh, when Fidel Castro dies, and he will eventually, um, <laughs> that um, <laughs> His, his brother is going to find that he uh, is not just going to be able to uh, appropriate Fidel Castro's authority to himself. And I would hope that by then the international community would have said to Cuba, 
you need a way to a transition to democracy. Rather than hoping that Raul Castro is somehow going to be a reformer, uh, state the principles, start to put in place a transition for a uh, democratic transition. It may take a while because there are no institutions in Cuba, but uh, particularly the Organization of American States, where Cuba is the only country that cannot take up its seat at the Organization of American States because it doesn't have an elected president, and the European Union need to be speaking out for the right for the Cubans for that transition. As to Chavez, as I said, he's destroyed his own country. And there, um, we, we tried something very interesting. When President Bush went to uh, Latin America um, in 2007, we actually didn't say ca uh, Chavez's name. And by the time we got to about the third country, he was running around saying, why don't they say something about me? Why don't they say something about me? <laughs> to a certain extent, you're better off to concentrate on what are dramatically improved conditions for democracy in most of Latin America. Colombia, which was brought back from the brink of being a failed state by uh, Alvarado uh, Uribe. Uh, a place like Chile, which has now had a couple of stable transitions. Brazil, which is a huge multi-ethnic democracy that uh, functions very, very well. Strong places in Central America. And uh, to emphasize them and to do good works for them. It's one reason the Colombian Free Trade Agreement ought to be passed. This is a place that is a democratic friend of America, and it deserves a free trade agreement with us, not to mention that economically it's good for both countries. So yes, the region has uh, some bad actors, but the region has far more in the way of stable uh, democracies that are friends of the United States, and I think by emphasizing those, uh, we diminish what the bad actors uh, can do. Um, other questions? There's a, a question over here, another one. And uh, while, while we go uh, hear those questions, we, we asked uh, on our Facebook page uh, if there were questions for Dr. Rice, and actually there were quite a few. <laughs> so we've just chosen a couple here. Um, now, one of them, you, you kind of, you certainly touched on it, but I, I, I wanted to, uh, to ask it anyway. This is from Dara Noib. Uh, Madam Secretary, how does the reflection of your own life experience influ influence your view of human freedom today? And she also says, thank you for your service, loved your book, <laughs> and you have another book that's coming out soon as well. Uh, wonderful, what a wonderful family you have. God bless you. Well, my upbringing obviously uh, made me optimistic about uh, what human beings can achieve even under difficult circumstances. I was born in 1954 in uh, segregated Birmingham, Alabama, the largest segregated city in America, a place where Jim Crow was alive and well. Bull Connor, the police commissioner, was the, uh, the fist of Jim Crow, and uh, George Wallace was its soul in the State House in uh, Montgomery. And so it was a pretty tough place uh, to, to be black in America but I was also fortunate to be brought up in a family uh, where my parents always said, uh, you may not be able to control your circumstances, but you can control your response to your circumstances. And always remember, there are no victims. The minute you start to believe yourself a victim, you have lost control. And then you give in to um, the aggrievement. Well, they aren't doing enough for me. And then entitlement, aggrievement's twin brother, and now you've completely lost control of your, your lives. And that was the way that we were brought up in Birmingham. And I see a reflection of that in so many people that are searching for freedom. They are responding to their circumstances. They are taking control uh, of their lives. They have impatient patriots, uh, as we did, and people like Martin Luther King and, and Rosa Parks who are helping to lead them. Um, but ultimately, uh, my, my childhood also taught me that it's important for uh, those voices to be heard and acknowledged. And so when the United States of America finally started to acknowledge the need to do something in the South, uh, those impatient patriots uh, were able to do more. And when the people in the Middle East or in, in Africa or in uh, Latin America or in Burma who are still uh, waiting to hear uh, those voices, hear the voice of America, it empowers them further. And so it tells me you really do have to take control of your circumstances, but you also need the, the voice of the powerful with you, and there's no more powerful voice than the United States. Over here. Dr. Rice, I'm 
Matthew Wilson. I'm a member of the political science department here at SMU, and uh, thank you for being with us today. My question deals with something we hear very often from leaders and pundits and commentators in the West when we say that what we want to see in the Middle East is the emergence of secular democracies. And that word secular troubles me in this context because I think it fosters the belief that somehow Islam and democracy are incompatible. And that if we want to see democracy emerge in the Middle East, that Islam's got to be pushed to the margins or something like that. How can we convince people in the Middle East that a transition to democracy doesn't mean an abandonment or a marginalization of their faith or of the role of Islam in their society? Thank you for an absolutely excellent question. And, and in fact, the, uh, the word secular, when we use it, we generally simply mean not the imposition of uh, religious beliefs. But we can't uh, mean the absence of religion and uh, a place for religious people. And you're seeing this play out very dramatically in Turkey right now, where uh, Turkey had held on to secularism through the Kemalist uh, doctrine in a way that basically said religious people have no place in the public square in Turkey, to put it very bluntly. And then, um, as democracy flourished in Turkey, uh, you have in the AK Party a uh, religious party, a, a party that uh, professes Islam, that is trying to democratize and says, no, but religious people need to have a place. It's not that we want to make people who are not religious or people who profess some other religion uncomfortable in the public square, but we want to make people who do profess religion comfortable in the public square. And you're seeing in Turkey, for instance, uh, I, Abdullah Gul, who is the, the, now the president of Turkey, used to be my foreign minister colleague, and I can remember discussing this with him. There was a lot of outrage that his wife covered. And he said, I have several female relatives. Some cover and some don't. He said, this is a matter of choice. And so we ought to be talking about democracy in the Middle East, where people can choose their religious uh, affiliations, exercise their religious beliefs, um, where a wide range of uh, religious beliefs are not just tolerated but encouraged. That's really the Middle East that we're looking for. And it's not one, certainly, where Islam uh, is somehow pushed to the side. Uh, Islam and democracy are doing very well, thanks, th thankfully, in Indonesia. They're doing very well in India. They're doing well in uh, Turkey. And I think they will do well uh, in the Middle East, as, uh, throughout the Middle East, because there is nothing in the tenets of Islam that suggests that you can't have uh, democracy and Islam in the same uh, body. And so thank you. It's a very, very wise point and one that we need to be careful um, about our language.